Good evening, and at least in the United States, and thank you very much for joining the American Bonification Hour under the sponsorship of Raj Dalve and C3 Interventional Academy. This has been really a successful story. These webinars have been very well attended with about 2,600 viewers in the last, the last uh, month's presentation. So I'm very pleased to have with us uh, two international visitors, and I'm, I thank them for being here in the middle of their night. Dr. Shiban from Italy, it's probably one in the morning, from Pedrozoli Hospital in Verona, and Dr. Francisco Lavara from Jilin Hospital in China, probably six in the morning. So the presenters are, as I said, uh, Dr. Moran, who is the director of the complex uh, PCI program and CTO at MUSC in Charleston. Uh, Azim Latib was world famous in bifurcation structure heart disease and uh, now is a uh, director of interventional cardiology and structure of Montefiore, New York. And without much ado, we'll get started with Dr. Moran being the first presenter. We're going to keep tight on our time with about 20 minutes for each case presentation and discussion. So, Marasi, lead it on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rob. Let me start my um, presentation. So today um, I, I will be talking about um, a decision-making process for a complex left main PCI. I'll start with a brief history. My patient is a 74-year-old uh, veteran who came in with a non-STEMI, a peak troponin of 10. He had a normal ejection fraction. He had a history of two vessel cabbage in 1999. He was on aspirin meter 50 milligrams BID, Rosuvat statin 20 milligrams, lisinopril daily. Apart from that, he also was a diabetic with um, chronic renal dysfunction, baseline creatinine of 1.8. This is his uh, initial diagnostic angiograms. As you can see, uh, the LAD with severe disease, you can see the uh, uh, pinching of the uh, pulling up of the LAD where the uh, lima um, is anastomose, and you can already make out that the lima is atritic out there. This is a different, uh, another um, uh, RA, RAO and you can see the severe distal left main disease and also the severe disease in the LAD itself and some diagonal disease. And here is the view of a uh, um, caudal view of the left main and the circumflex and the uh, LAD also. This is from a uh, spider view. There's a little bit of overlap. I think my AP caudal was a little bit better than my spider view, but you can see how critical the disease is in the circumflex. All right. And this is the RCA, a severe diffuse disease. And we had a lot of trouble um, going after the graphs. There was one, this is the atritic lima, which we kind of already uh, saw from the native pictures itself. There's some flow, but it's just diffusely atritic. And we kept searching and searching for the graphs. And then finally, I had to do an iotogram. And then I saw the uh, vein graft kind of coming up high up. And here is a picture of that. Kind of Timmy to bush flow. There was a lesion there, but I was not too impressed. And the, um, it's such a small vessel beyond the anastomosis. And I thought I would be causing more trouble. So I didn't think that was the culprit but we can have more discussion about that. So should we uh, talk here right now and think about what would the rest of the panel want to do for this left main? Zim? Well, well, actually it seems to me that uh, there's some severe classification on uh, left main and proximal LED. Uh, I see severe stenosis only on uh, proximal LAD, not that much on left main, at least at Anjo. So I, I'd like to, I mean, if I will be planning something, I'll start with IVUS or intravascular imaging in order to define exactly the distribution of plaque and plan my procedure here. Yeah, I would agree. I, I think you know, there's a lot of calcium. I'd be thinking of some sort of plaque modification. 
and you know what I'm going to use to reduce that calcium. But it's the circumflex from these images looks okay. I don't know what you think, Imad. Um, obviously, it'd be lovely to see some intravascular imaging to understand better the calcium and the severity. But just looking at it, I'm kind of still thinking kind of, you know, one stent provisional approach right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to show you all. I mean, this was a little tricky. So I'm just going to go back a couple of slides. I want to just play this uh, 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 angiogram. And in yeah. this, you can kind of see um, in a non-selective chart of the distal left main. Actually, that was when, uh, and you can see the kind of haziness in the distal left main. And uh, there were a couple of other views in my spider view where you could make out uh, the severe calcium, the distal left main. But I agree. Uh, when you just straight look at the angiogram, definitely there's concern, need for more imaging and things like that. Yes. So um, as part of the pre-procedure planning, we started off thinking of axis. We wanted to go radial axis. Um, this is a kind of like an unpredicted distal left main PCI in the setting of normal e, um, ejection fraction because the lima is atritic. Patient did have a normal LVEDP. Uh, we were thinking this uh, vessel size discrepancy between the left main and the uh, uh, LAD. So I was thinking more in terms of orbital atherectomy so that I can adjust the speed and stick to a six French axis itself after intravascular imaging. And uh, I, in my mind, if I mean, obviously this would be based on IVIS, I was thinking more in terms of Medina 111 classification uh, with the lesion. So uh, if at all, my technique was if uh, ba based on IVIS, it would probably, uh, I was leaning towards uh, more of a mini crush technique than anything else. So this are, these are the steps. I'm not gonna go through that. I just put it there for the sake of the audience. Um, so this is my, uh, guide shot and i think that kind of mind is there's no imaging performed is that correct or... so i have to apologize i did have intravascular imaging but my va is set up in such a way i cannot pull the uh, uh, ivis images uh, from the va so i have I, I'll show, I'll pro prove it to you. I did IVIS, but I don't have intravascular imaging. So with the intravascular imaging, our IVIS catheter would not, we have the volcano manual pullback IVIS and it would not even go past the circumflex. We could only IVIS the left main into the LAD prior to atherectomy. Uh, and there was severe calcium everywhere. And I, as I said, I could not even get the IVIS into, my, uh, into the circumflex. So this is the first guiding uh, guide chart. And we did, um, uh, as I said uh, uh, earlier, we did um, orbital atherectomy. And I usually, when there's planning, uh, when I plan to do left main and LAD atherectomy, I do 80 RPMs uh, initially. And in the left main uh, alone, I go up to 120 RPMs, uh, uh, just so I get a bigger arc and more sanding with the orbit. And after, uh, even after orbital atherectomy, uh, we had to serially dilate with a 3.5 NC balloon <clears throat> and a 3.5 wall um, uh, cutting balloon uh, into the LAD and the circumflex. And in the circumflex, uh, uh, it was a 2.515 uh, by N 15 NC balloon. And then I have did a 3.0 by 26 uh, drug eluting stent in the LAD and a 2.5 by 15 drug eluting stent to the circumflex. And here you can make out that one, a couple of my stent struts are kind of in the uh, left main itself. And uh, this is just my um, circumflex stenting procedure. And after that, now um, the, there's no dissection in the circumflex, the flow in the circumflex looks good. Remove the wire in the circ, uh, stent in the LAD. And after that, I'm um, uh, dilating the left main uh, portion with a 4, 5, 20 NC balloon of the, and then I rewired the circumflex with the Miracle 3 wire and initially ballooned it with a 2015 NC balloon through the- uh, Can I ask a question? Yes, um, please. Just because I think it's important for the, you know, the fellows and people joining us. So. I mean, one of the challenges with a crush, particularly, so this is more classical mini crush, and we'll talk about the techniques at the end, is recrossing into the side branch. Yes. 
am I to assume that the reason you used a miracle is because you had challenges recrossing? Yes. Can you just share with us what, what do you normally use? So normally, I mean, my first workhouse wire is a run-through wire. And if the run-through does not work, I go for a more hydrophilic wire, like either a char PT or a whisper wire. If the hydrophilic does not work, then I go for the Miracle Brothers family. And all those wires serially failed for me. And then I said, okay, fine, I'm just going to go for the Miracle. And that's where I came to the Miracle too. Uh, what are your uh, strategies for rewiring? Yeah, I agree. You know, I... The, um, when you look at you know the, all the classical crush papers and the mini crush, and even you look at the BBC study, which is one of the studies they gave like a really bad name to crush. Mm -hmm. Okay, a lot of the 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 challenges happened uh, because of the inability to recross into the side branch and to perform a final kiss, mm -hmm. um, and that was kind of why I think the kind of the classical crush mini crush kind of fell out of favor a little bit was because a great operator like you is going to manage, right? But maybe the more junior attending who's starting out in his practice is going to struggle to do that final kiss. Uh, mm -hmm. And we know that it's the final kiss that is probably the most important factor to prevent restenosis and stent thrombosis. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't do mini, you know, mi classical mini crushes anymore because of that, because also I'm in a teaching institution, teaching fellows all the time. So I want them to guard with a, with a technique that they can do if I'm not there. Um, but I have a very similar approach to you is I start with a polymer jacket wire, probably, you know, either I really like for crossing through stents and side branches. I really like the Sion blue because mm -hmm. of the fact that it keeps its tip curve. And so you can really try a few times. If that doesn't work, I may use the fielder FC. And then I think I then eventually will go like you to a Miracle 3. Uh, in Europe, they have a wire called the Intermediate, which is just one level below the Miracle 3, also from Asahi, which just gives you that tip control that you had in this, you needed in this case to be able to go through those struts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I absolutely agree. I, I think that challenging also is if you are using a, a small stent in the mini crush, that means 2.5 will be much more challenging to cross after crushing than bigger stent, than 3, 3.5. Um, but again, I, I think in this case, particularly I, from angio, angiographic uh, point of view, I, I, I will go for um, for uh, just provisional stenting uh, cross over from left main to LAD and leave circumflex free of stent. Uh, I don't know, we, we didn't uh, see the um, uh, intravascular imaging. Maybe, maybe uh, it was uh, tight stenosis, I don't know, but it, it doesn't seem like that on Angel. No, it was pretty tight. I, I, I can promise you. The problem is my VA does not archive my iris images. So if I don't download them on the same day, the iris images are gone. So this mm. case, I, I did it December. And by the time I um, went back to pick up for presentation, the iris images were gone. So that's why I don't have the iris images. Even mm. to uh, uh, kind of wire and balloon, I had to serially balloon, uh, go for the cutting balloon and everything into the circumflex. And honestly, I felt I should have done atherectomy of the circumflex also. And then that would have saved me a lot of uh, trouble with the rewiring uh, strategies because I just did all atherectomy of the left main into the LAD. Mm. So uh, the, it, it, there was, it was just, a, this person is a chunk of calcium everywhere. He mm -hmm. has severe iliac disease, he has severe calcium everywhere. And uh, he's actually, uh, funnily enough, back in the hospital for his right coronary artery right now. So we'll soon be dealing with that. So yeah, it was difficult. And then I had to balloon with the 2-0 balloon initially of, of the uh, less, uh, left circumflex, uh, left main um, LAD stent strut. And then only then was I able to uh, do the final kiss with the 3-5-15 and the 2-5-15 and the circumflex. So can you, can you this tell so just Maybe. to show you guys, I did Ivis. Yeah. I'm, I'm not fibbing. So we I believed you. We believed you. <laughs> so I was glad I stole Florence one image. <laughs> and um, 
this is uh, the LAD uh, result. And then this is my uh, spider. And even here, you can see the lower end of the stent right here, and you can see a, still a lead, big chunk of calcium still there. Mm -hmm. And if you remember, I had post dilated with a four or five balloon, and I didn't want to go I, more aggressive than that because that calcium has to go somewhere, and I didn't want to cause a perforation mm -hmm. or a dissection. So it looked okay on Iris, and I just decided to leave it alone. Mm -hmm. So, um, I chose mini crush in this case mainly because of the size discrepancy, and uh, uh, because if you if I had to do a cool out uh, technique, uh, if I'm doing a single stent strategy, that would be okay. But if I had to do a cool out, there was there would be a significant size discrepancy between the left main and the circumflex stenting, and um, that is why I thought uh, maybe a mini crush would give me enough carinal uh, coverage and I could uh, uh, get a good result. And uh, once again, careful pre-procedure planning uh, and uh, uh, concern about calcium everywhere. He had severe right iliac artery calcification. So radial axis was suitable. And uh, given the left main um, amount of calcium, if I had to go uh, rotational atherectomy, I would have had to choose a 175 burr and then up go to a seven French system. Whereas with orbital atherectomy, I was able to do this entire case with a six French system itself. So, um, and I was, uh, by changing the speed of the orbital atherectomy, uh, I was able to clean out the LAD and then go faster speed uh, for the left main itself. With this, I will end and um, take any questions or discussions. Ar Arazi, that's a great case, great final result. Um, I think there are a couple of interesting parts that maybe we can, um, for the fellows, highlight. Um, and I'm going to start with the excess. I'm, I'm so glad you're showing radial and showing that really complex PCI can be done via the radial, uh, whether it's bifurcations, left main, atherectomy. Um, being a sort of still having one foot in Europe, I'm a strong believer in radial for doing these interventions. I just wanted to ask you about the size of the guide catheter you use when you're doing bifurcation PCI via the radial, because if you're gonna put two stents into the coronary at the same time, so you can do atherectomy with six French, you can do a DK crush with six French, but if you're going to do a classical mini crush where you put two stents in at the same time, don't you need bigger, like seven French? This was, uh, if I remember right, it was a six, seven French thermal sheet and a seven French axis. Uh, uh, seven and, French uh, guide. Okay. Yeah, seven French, sorry, seven French guide. Excellent. And uh, uh, that's why I was able to put the two stents at the same time. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, actually, you can crush the stent with balloon. Uh, and uh, you can do it with six French anyway. I mean, uh, yeah. e even mini crush. So I, I think six French can, can it's a good option. Uh, also for mini, mini crush, uh, then you can use uh, crushing with uh, the second stand. That's uh, hmm. yeah, so I the second problem. stand and recross. Otherwise you are doing DK crush. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, maybe in left main with a big balloon to post dilate and do kissing is useful to use a seven French for big balloon when you have a big circ and big LED and then you want to kiss with four and five, for example. This can be helpful also to have a, a seven French guiding. Is there an audience question for you, Rossi? Yes. So we, uh, I thought we only spun at low speed. So, um, so spinning at high speed is not um, for the first year post uh, fellowship person. After you've done enough number of cases and you've understood the orbital atherectomy really well and you're absolutely comfortable, uh, then uh, in the left main in a big vessel, which is, uh, you know, uh, on my IVIS, it was uh, about a, a four or five vessel. So I was comfortable going higher speeds. And when you go at 120 RPMs, you're going very, very slowly. My technique for orbital atherectomy is I count, I say it in my head itself, one Mississippi move, two Mississippi move. But when I'm going higher speeds, I'm going one Mississippi, two Mississippi move, 
one Mississippi, two Mississippi move. So you're going much more slower. So you're getting yourself a big arc. So again, it is not for a 3-0 vessel. It is not even for a 3-5 vessel. When you have a 4-0 vessel or 4-5 vessel, then I, uh, getting um, going higher speeds will give you a bigger arc. And I personally feel that's the only advantage of uh, uh, orbital atherectomy over um, uh, uh, rotational atherectomy because you can adjust the arc according to the speed at which you're moving and the RPMs also. Arasi, can I ask maybe one question? And I wanted to make one comment for the fellows. Um, so maybe I'll start with a comment. So, you know, the technique you did of having two stents is a technique for the fellows I like to use sometimes when I have a very unstable patient or I'm in the setting of you know, a STEMI with thrombus in the left main. I think it's a great technique because you can go put two stents in very quickly and you can secure the bifurcation, right? And get the patient off the table and come back to fight another day, as I'd like to say. Even if you can't do the kiss, you can come back the next day with a senior operator and do the kiss. And so when I have a very unstable patient, I like the technique you showed and you showed a, a great example of it. Um, you mentioned, you know, that circumflex was really difficult and um, w would you have felt comfortable doing CSI around the bend of the circumflex just for the fellows or would you, is there special techniques you do? I mean, the LED is pretty straight, but when you have to go around a curve, any special tips for the fellows? Yes, yeah, so go slow. I mean, again, go slow. And you want your assistant to have a little back tension on the wire so that the wire does not buckle or bend over as your bur uh, as the rotation uh, orbital atrophy or any bird is going. So go very, very slow. And this would be a situation, all hands on deck and your uh, you got your entire team, your, uh, no one's checking cell phones or anything of that sort. Everyone is watching everything and uh, you're going very, very slow and you're not going to go five, six rounds. You're going to, you just want to sand a little bit, just, you know, clean out uh, what I call calcicle sticking into the artery. So just a couple of rounds and get, uh, go slow and steady and um, back tension on the wire would be the tip I would say. Mm. Well, thank you, Arasi. We need to move to the next speaker. Uh, so Francisco Lavares joining us from Jalen in China. And thank you for this early morning presentation for you, Francisco. So go ahead and get started, please. Thank you very much, Tawir. Uh, and uh, so uh, my case is a double decay crash and PSO for a no more surgical patient. I have no conflict of interest. The patient came to our hospital for a second intervention after a previous uh, PCI in a local hospital where we was treated uh, right coronary extensive thrombosis with five stent. The patient uh, had a normal ejection fracture with inferior, posterior and lateral echokinesia and unstable CCS class three. Uh, he was an ex-smoker and a non-insulin diabetic uh, patient. Was on ticagrelor and aspirin and beta blocker, atorvastatin and metformin. This is uh, the control of right coronary artery that is quite good, but with uh, um, extensive disease on posterolateral vessels and uh, occluded PDA reperfused by uh, left uh, circulation. And on the left, you can see extensive uh, disease on LAD in middle and distal. ...to big uh, uh, OM. We went by uh, femoral seven French because the radial was occluded during uh, uh, the previous intervention. Uh, we uh, started to address uh, uh, LED with uh, our workhorse uh, wire, and then we tried to wire uh, diagonal. <clears throat> and it uh, was quite tricky to go in the diagonal. It was not possible to go with the Sion wire. Then we used <clears throat> a micro catheter to uh, 
to pass with the filter XT wire. Uh, we said that the patient is not anymore surgic, uh, surgical. Why? Although the patient was diabetic and with extensive disease and with syntax score, uh, sure, more than 32, the patient was recently, three weeks before, treated in another hospital at five stent implanted, was on ticagrelor. Of course, it's always possible to do a bridge therapy with tirofiban. LED was occluded, the, the posterior lateral were very diseased, and the landing zone for LED was very apical. We redilated LED with uh, 2.75 non-compliant balloon. Uh, and then this was the result. And we implanted two stent in distal and middle LED, not covering the diagonal. <clears throat> then we uh, redilated the, the, the D1 with non-compliant balloon. And we implanted uh, there <clears throat> with uh, uh, aiming to do a decay crash a long stand 2.538. Then we pulled out the uh, device, the delivery, and we performed the proximal side at higher pressure. So dilated better the ostium of uh, diagonal. Then we crashed with a 3.515 non compliant balloon uh, on. LAD, uh, we rewired the uh, diagonal with the, our workhorse wire. Then we performed the first kissing. And then we moved to the second bifurcation that was uh, uh, involving LAD, hostial and circuit left me. Here we predilated the, the uh, CERC with a big uh, non compliant balloon, 3.5, 15. And uh, as you see, there is extensive dissection in uh, both LED and CERC. Then we implanted the uh, stent on, uh, on uh, CERC. That was uh, 3.533. And then again, we pulled uh, back the delivery uh, and we performed at higher pressure, the proximal side optimization. Um, then we crashed with the 5.08 non-compliant balloon, the stand on the circuit. Then we rewired the circuit Ramos, and then we performed the kissing on the CERC uh, LED. <clears throat> now the stand, uh, the two bifurcation are ready for stand in the main branch. And then we actually, we did the two bifurcation, uh, covering the two bifurcation with one stand, implanting a 4.038 stand from left main to middle LED, covering both CERC and D1. The implantation was done at 12 atmosphere. Then we did the pot and flaring with the bigger balloon that we already used for uh, crash, the 5.08. Then we rewired the diagonal that was quite easy with our workhorse uh, wire, because uh, as uh, I will tell you, the with PSO proximal side optimization. Uh, the uh, rewiring that is the most important part is more easy. We open the struts on the diagonal. We perform the kissing on LED diagonal. And then we rewire the circ. We open the strut, the circ with the previous balloon 4.0. And then we did kissing pot and flaring with the 5.0 left main. This is our uh, final result, quite acceptable for this complex lesion. Uh, DK crash can manage, uh, as we know, also very complex uh, cases with uh, keeping uh, control of all branches also very severe.
we didn't use IOS this or OCT. Uh, we we work in a, in a special charity hospital, so we don't use too much often this uh, uh, imaging. But uh, PSO, the proximal size or semi optimization, is most useful in this situation because we uh, make a geared ostium of side branch stent and more uh, easy the rewiring in the right spot. Of course, the patient is diabetic, but quite young and uh, could uh, also in the future get uh, uh, cabg if needed. And uh, uh, of course, we hope that we will have a free uh, event uh, survival for a long time. We didn't use uh, intra aortic balloon pump or impella because the patient had good ejection fraction. The SCA was patent, although the PDA was included. DK crash is an established technique for complex bifurcation lesion. And this is the proximal side optimization. So when you implant inside branch the stent, then you pull back the delivery and you inflate at higher pressure. Most of the time we use high pressure balloon there before crash, bigger balloon to uh, make more adherent the ostium of side branch and more easy the rewiring. In this way, we use less uh, special wire, uh, as also said uh, the Dr. Marani in, in uh, her case, and less new balloon. This make more easy, more bigger the space of optimal uh, wiring, and is not more so essential to go proximal for first kissing. This is another case that we did, in which is explained uh, this uh, procedure of proximal side optimization with the delivering with higher pressure balloon, uh, bigger balloon. These are our publications uh, that uh, explain this uh, refinement, US uh, Cardiology Review, uh, Cardiovascular Medicine, and uh, Romanian Journal of Cardiology. And thanks to that, this uh, refinement was uh, suggested and uh, recognized by EBC consensus uh, 2020 as important step of the crash. And uh, I had the opportunity to present this also to during the CBS, the Congress of Shaolian Chen, the inventor of DK Crash. And uh, this uh, technique was uh, used from a friend and colleague uh, around the world. Uh, Francesco Burzotta did a case with Impella with this technique with a great result. Marek Ferenc of uh, Bart Rozingen will. Uh, input this technique in uh, his new study comparing DK culotte and DK crash. And uh, as you see, Professor Chen recognizes it as important this technique. So uh, finally, uh, the rewiring is the most demanding and crucial step of uh, this uh, DK crash. And uh, if you do a better expansion of ostium uh, of side branch stent, this make more easy the rewiring with the normal uh, material that you use, workhorse material, and with all balloon that you can use from beginning to the end. This is, of course, important if you use IVUS or OCT, but most important in the 95% of patient uh, all around the world where we don't or we can't use IGUS or OCT. And this make more easy the, uh, the rewiring. And so I suggest this step as important also for a uh, normal crash. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. It is great, great case. Uh, I have some concern about this technique. I mean, this step, additional step. Uh, you are doing, you are optimizing before crashing, right? Yes. Yes. 
So after crushing, if you are crushing with a big balloon, I think something, some gap will be again produced by crushing on the ostium. If you are crushing the stent, then that means optimizing the stent before, then crushing the stent, then it depends on the angle. You might have some gap on the opposite wall of the at the carina or, on, or at the opposite uh, side. So why not doing that after crushing the stent and going for optimization after crushing when you are crossing the crush stent and then optimize? I, I agree that uh, could be some smaller uh, malaposition on this side, but if you do with uh, delivery at very high pressure, and then you use a bigger balloon. Most, of course, the key crushing when is used when the side branch length lesion is uh, consistent, is uh, great, so is long. Then you have for sure some malposition proximally because uh, you choose the stent on the distal diameter of side branch. So actually, making. Yeah, actually, making this uh, make much more easy. And now, if you see the last presentation of uh, Shaolian Chen, he is actually using what I suggested, uh, uh, not using the delivering, but using a bigger uh, high pressure balloon, non-compliant balloon before the crash. So I saw the presentation that I did few weeks ago in another meeting. So, uh, although he uh, presented- No, I, I'm not discussing about the validity of the, of, of the concept. I'm just saying that if I you, will do, I will do it after crashing because I mean, I will optimize the ostium after crashing the stand because that will ensure me that everything will be in, uh, in, in place. So the problem is that you 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 will do also after, but doing before makes more easy to the wire okay, when you rewire okay. going no, not between. Okay, I will do it. And the do it before and after. Before and after. <laughs> yeah. So we, no, we it, doing 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 before make all, makes only make more sure before. going inside and not outside you know, makes more easy and reliable going in the right way. I usually 95% of time, my okay. BMW wire to recross. Got it. Or yeah. not a it. miracle. I never use miracle to recross. We, we, we need to hear of... other comments. Yeah. Yeah. Might, if we don't do it, we're gonna send, we're gonna send Francesco to, to your hospital to make sure, hey? Um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> As one okay. of the messages, I mean, I, you know, I want to be sure that the fellows get a very balanced message of what we're trying to teach, right? I think you see that they now, if you go in the literature, there are lots of variations of, of all these bifurcation techniques. Yeah, and I sure. think it's very important for them, for the fellows to learn a technique, you know, from beginning to end, you know, one of the, you know, and know how to do it properly. The one thing I would say, though, um, to the fellows starting out doing complex bifurcations, please, please, please do imaging. Um, check that the how you're implanting these multiple stents, okay, you're doing it properly, you know. And I, and the message I, I always have, and I always remember, is the one Antonio Colombo always used to say to me, you know, and he said that, and this is the inventor of the crush, right? He would also, he would always say, the minute you decide to implant two stents in someone's bifurcation, you take on a big responsibility. And so it is on you, the onus as the operator, to make sure you get an excellent result. Absolutely, you have to be yeah. better than you normally are with any other stent when you put two stents in someone's bifurcation. So that's maybe a message I'll give the fellows. Absolutely, I, I totally agree with you. I think planning, uh, preparing the lesion, doing IVUS, I mean, intravascular imaging is essential. Optimizing, absolutely, even with single stent, any procedure you are doing, you should optimize. Mm -hmm. 
and step I think by it's step. important uh, to know that I Dr. Navarra has so many years of experience. He can, he will be able to, uh, he, he, in his mind, he can kind of conceptually visualize the bifurcation, which the new uh, fellows won't be able to. And that's why we have to uh, uh, depend on imaging. And after you've gained wisdom and experience, like Dr. Navarra, you can go ahead and do a bifurcation without imaging. But so keep that, um, it's experience is invaluable. And um, when you don't have it, you have to take all the tools you can get to help yourself. Yes, of course, depends also where you live and which are the, the availability of material. And, you know, it's, it's of course, in Milano, I, I should have used Ivus for sure. Yeah. So, Arazi, by, by your definition, I'm still a fellow then. Because... <laughs> <laughs> That's a good lead to... Uh, to... <laughs> I'm still using IVIS in 100% of my oh, left no. veins in bifurcation. We never stop learning in interventional cardiology. We never <laughs> stop learning. <laughs> okay, I'm done. I'm not learning anymore. Retire. So all of us are still fellows. <laughs> exactly. So we go to Azim's presentation now, okay? And uh, yeah, absolutely. I'll see we discuss along with it Just give me a second while I share my slides. So I kind of feel bad for the fellows, you know, um, because it seems like all we're showing you here is two stents. Because uh, I'm going to show you a two stent technique, a two stent case as well. And it seems that tonight is like we should have called it the crush night uh, because we're only showing crushes one after the other. But hopefully I'm going to try and be a little bit didactic about some of the steps and maybe some of the caveats that I've learned over the years that can maybe make some of the steps easier. So I'll try and I'll try and highlight some of those. So I'll take you through a complex bifurcation case. These are my conflicts of interest. So this is a graph I still use. This is from Antonio. Me and Antonio des designed this years ago, just to really think about when we when we use two stent techniques, you know, which technique to use. I think about when you use two stack techniques, I would recommend that you look at Ima Chaban's paper, definition paper, and the definition criteria, because Ima, I really think you did a great job of defining which are the complex bifurcations that require two stents? My compliments, really, I, I keep saying this about those criteria. And I think if we all stuck to those criteria, we would you know, treat the right bifurcations with two stents. But you know, I essentially do culottes, T stents, and DK mini crushes. I think it's important to learn one technique um, very well, but you know, more than often than not, you need more than one technique. Uh, and that's important. So let me take you through my patient. He's a 76-year-old male, hypertensive dyslipidemia, COPD, chronic AF, severe peripheral vascular disease, presents with a new diagnosis of ischemic cardiomyopathy, ejection fraction varying, there was even one echo showing 17%, but varying between 20 and 25%, complaining of angina on minimal effort and dyspnea on exertion. What's interesting, even though his ejection fraction is low, if you look at his LV dimensions, they're pretty small. The volume of his LV in diastole is only 78 mils. So a small ventricle. It's not this big dilated ventricle. And he had normal RV size and function. So I'm actually going to be very honest. I, I was the second operator for this case. I, one of my young junior attendings in my uh, practice uh, wanted to do this case. And I stood there trying to mentor him uh, through the case. So, you know, uh, Dr. Alvarez, who works with me, is the first year attending, did this case. And, and I never had to actually intervene. He did the whole case by himself. But I just thought it was a good case to share with all of you. Um, and I hope for the fellows, you know, you can you start doing these cases with almost a proctor uh, who sits there and helps you go through these cases, right, together. So here's the coronary angiography of this patient. Uh, right coronary artery is non-dominant. Uh, you see this really left dominant system. There's this very diffuse disease in the circumflex. But really, I think what the most significant lesion is and where the patient is going to get the most benefit is this really long LAD lesion. Um, as you can see, there's also yeah, a really large bifurcation with a diagonal um, with some you know, focal disease proximally. So Imad, I'm gonna just stop and ask you, by definition criteria, 
would this be a complex bifurcation that requires two stents? Yeah, I, I think this is a classical uh, complex bifurcation. You have a long lesion on side branch, which is uh, the side branch is uh, uh, absolutely relevant side branch. Uh, so I think that uh, this uh, uh, measure criteria are there. And uh, of course, uh, uh, minor criteria, I think, uh, is, is given by complex anatomy that you have long lesion also on main vessel. Uh, it is, uh, um, you have also tortuosity. I see also some calcification there. So you have more than one, my, two minor criteria and one major criteria, then this is what we is, should be defined uh, complex bifurcation and go uh, for planning to uh, stand strategy. Okay. So complex bifurcation, large territory at risk. Arasi, uh, what do you think about hemodynamic support in this case? Would you do hemodynamic support? I mean, as EF is 25%, you said, uh, I don't yeah. re recall a LVEDP. Um, if you are, uh, and, you, and there is severe mitral regurgitation also, am I correct? Yes. Yeah, I would at least start with a right heart cath, get some hemodynamic uh, uh, numbers, and then decide. Okay, there you go. There you go. <laughs> I, knew, I knew you were going to ask for that, Arazi. I, I didn't prepare you for this, but there you go. Here's your numbers. Okay. Yes, I would definitely consider hemodynamic support for this. All right. So just for the fellows, you know, the wedge pressure is up. It's 21. The pulmonary pressures are up, but look at the cardiac output, right? The cardiac output is really very low and the cardiac index is only 0 0.8. But, you know, there's also pretty bad access here. The, the right femoral was not approachable. The left we thought was approachable. So we decided we would put an impeller via the left, an impeller CP, and then do the actual PCI via the radial. Mm. Uh, um, have you maybe, I don't know, Thinking about access through the impeller sheath itself is also yeah. an option. Yeah, absolutely. So for the fellows, you know, the easiest technique of single access, right? So after you've put your impeller, there's enough, you can puncture the, um, the valve of uh, the impeller sheath and use a micropuncture and you can essentially get a seven French sheath up there. I, I would just caution two things about it. I, I, we used to do a lot of single access cases for the last two years. I've stopped doing them because I just because, again, I'm in a teaching institution. Two, two words of caution I have about it is the one is when you have a seven French destination in there and your impeller, there's a lot of friction between the two and you sometimes can't move your impeller anymore. OK, and as you're trying to manipulate your guide catheter, if you have one of those cases, where you do a lot of manipulation, you can move the impeller as well. So be careful of that. Part mm -hmm. of the other reason why we moved away from it was, and because we do radial, uh, our PCIs is, is it allows you then at the end of the procedure to do a final angiogram after you've pulled out the impeller and also to have an access, a bailout access. If they, you know, your probe lights fail or you have some vascular issue, you have another access. So we kind of did a lot of it. I'm kind of moving away from it. I don't think there's a right answer, but I, you know, in my own practice has just been that. Um, so we put a seven French sheet via the left radial. Um, like I said, an impeller CP with two proglides and pre-closure. And you can see we leave the palmy artery catheter in during these procedures because we'll do the hemodynamics at the end of the procedure again, just to decide whether we're going to remove the impeller or not. Uh, mm -hmm. Go ahead, sorry. Uh, no. Uh, Ima had mentioned there was a lot of calcium, so we went with Rota. We did a 1.5 burr, which struggled a little bit on the second curve. It did the first part fairly easy, but we really had to work the second area over here before the, the Rota would pass. After the Rota, uh, uh, we did a um, 3 on non-compliant balloon and then did imaging. Um, and I think, you know, it's... We couldn't get an imaging catheter down in the beginning. We did try, but what I wanted you to notice was that area we just passed. So despite the rotor, there's still this really large napkin ring area of calcification here, okay? Mm -hmm. And if you look at the diameter of this, I mean, it's too big, you know, it's pretty big. It was measured over two millimeters. So to do a, you know, a bigger burr, I wasn't sure was gonna be effective, 
I guess at this stage, Arasi, I mean, what would you do? Would you go with cutting balloon or would you go with um, an orbital? Uh, I, I mean, I think it's too, I kind of try to stick to one device uh, mm. uh, just for the cost uh, of it itself. At this point, I think once you've done a one fiber, you should be able to deliver a good size two phi or a three o Wolverine cutting balloon. Your goal is you just want to produce fractures in this three or uh, 60 degree calcium so that uh, your stent can expand. And I think after your initial ablation, uh, the cutting balloon would do that for you. Okay. Mm. So cutting balloons is one option, carries a little bit of risk of perforation, calcified lesions, but it's a really great option and it's safe to do after rotor. So there was people in the past who were concerned about doing it after rotor. I think if you do it in this kind of lesion, it is safe. Imad, what about in Europe? You have other devices we don't have here in the United States. Well, actually, I mean, we have uh, uh, lithotherapy mm -hmm. now. Uh, and I think this is one of the indication for lithotherapy. That means after rotaplation, uh, you uh, you can uh, have. I mean, you can apply uh, lithotherapy, and this will give you more chance to uh, reduce calcification, also deep calcification, and to ensure more expansion of the stent. So uh, this is uh, what. Uh, is um, a second option, an alternative to uh, cutting balloon. Yeah, absolutely. So lithotripsy got, just got approved last week, I think, in the United States for coronaries. Mm. It was only approved when we did this case in January, about three weeks ago for peripheral. So unfortunately, what I'm going to show you is off-label. You don't have to do this anymore. And I apologize for showing you something off-label. But this is what we decided to do, was we use the peripheral shockwave balloon in the coronary. It's the uh, same shocklet, amount okay. of energy. Sorry? Shockwave balloon? Yeah, but the peripheral uh, one, okay. because it wasn't approved, the coronary one. So we did okay. shockwave in the coronary. This, uh, it only comes in, it used to come in a 40 millimeter balloon, so very long. But I wanted to show you the IVIS, and because I think the IVIS really... When you see these images with shockwave, look at this area. You know, you can wow. see now the fractures in the calcium, right, wow. with the shockwave. I mean, it's just dramatic, the difference it made. Everywhere you see fractures. And mm. this lumen is no longer small and tight the way it looked like before. Here's the bifurcation coming in with a diagonal, but really a great result with the shockwave afterwards. Absolutely. And the nice thing about shockwave is it's very safe. Uh, you don't get perforations and you don't get distal embolization. Mm. I'm sure it must have been challenging to deliver uh, that uh, 3.5 shockwave balloon. Oh, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> we never talk about these things. No, I mean, I'm, I really, we thank God now there is a coronary shockwave balloon approved in the United States. Like I say, please don't be doing this. Um, I'm showing this more not to encourage off-label use, but to show you this concept of rotor shock, of the fact that sometimes you need to combine multiple devices to really treat calcium. And that's really for the fellows, the message I wanna get uh, out of showing you this. Mm. So here's the result um, afterwards, much better. The diagonal didn't look great. So we dilated the diagonal first with a 2-0 balloon um, and was difficult, challenging to wire the diagonal. There was a little bit of dissection at the diagonal and you really need to be careful when you're done, you know, um, wiring through dissection. Um, but this is after we dilated some more the diagonal with, with a 2-5 balloon. You can see a long lesion with some osteal dissection. So a great case for why you want to use a DK crush or a crush technique. So we decided to put a 2.5 by 30 millimeter balloon. It's really important when you're doing a DK crush uh, to minimize. I mean, it should be really a DK mini crush, right? Because you always want to minimize the amount of stent struts protruding into your main branch. So, you know, use multiple projections for the LED diagonal. Steep LAO cranials are really usually useful to give you the widest angle on your bifurcation to make sure you're really not protruding too much into the main branch. So. We delivered the stent. I did, of course, I did a PSO. So I pulled back a little bit and I went to higher pressure. Um, then remember after that, always do an angiogram, okay, before crushing. Because if you have a distal edge dissection here, now is the time to treat it, okay? Because 
it'll just be easier to tweet it now and go through the stents rather than trying to get through later. So I always do an angiogram before I pull out the wire. It looks good. I pull out the wire and then I go with a non-compliant balloon at one to as close as possible as I feel safe at one to one. Okay, so yeah, I went with a 3.5 non-compliant balloon at very high pressure. And this is really one of the important steps I wanted to highlight. If you don't crush properly the main branch, okay, in the main branch, the side branch stand, the stent can look like this. You can't see this in a, in a patient's artery. This is in a pig model in the, in the visible heart, a, a case we did to show how incomplete crush can look like if you don't use a non-compliant balloon one-to-one. -one. And the problem then is when you try and wire, you have no control over where your wire goes. Your wire can go anywhere. And as you try and push that balloon and force it through, you can really mangle these stents okay, and make your procedure so much more difficult. So it's really, I think, one of the most important things I've learned about DK crush or step crush or mini crush, however you want to call it, is you really have to make sure that you've used a high pressure non-compliant balloon one-to-one -to, -one to crush those side branch stents. We then did our first kiss. I don't know what you do, Ima, but I do almost a two-step kiss, okay? Uh, I first, you know, go with my side branch balloon and I go to really high pressure, okay? And then I, I go with both my balloons to sort of 12. So yeah, I went with, you know, my side branch balloon to 20, 22 atmospheres. And then I did the first kiss with 10, about 10, 12 atmospheres in both balloons. Do you do, do, you do something similar, Imad? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm always uh, starting with side branch uh, dilatation separately, mm -hmm. and then going for simultaneous uh, inflation of both balloons at the uh, uh, same atmosphere. Uh, right. Sometimes I'm also inflating separately, main vessel and side branch separately, and then finally kissing balloon. Right. Uh, but starting every time from uh, uh, side branch. Great. So, yeah, I um, I just want to uh, ask this. Uh, sometimes I notice when you do the side branch balloon and then and if the side branch balloon is not kind of overlapping the uh, main branch stent, the, when you inflate the main branch, the side branch balloon gets kind of watermelon seeded uh, further down. So I have found it, I'm just looking at uh, 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 Latib's uh, picture. I would have maybe chosen a longer balloon or have a longer uh, overlap in the main branch. Uh, do you, are you? Yeah, I think that's a great point. It can, it can definitely help at times if you're melon seeding. I just, I guess I've gotten lazy. <laughs> I just always use, you know, the same size balloons or okay. same length balloons for both my um, main branch and side branch because it just allows me to overlap proximally with the two markers, but you could use longer balloons. I don't mm -hmm. think there's any issue with doing that. Uh, and I think, you know, it may, it may sometimes give you less issues. Agreed. No, I, actually the main thing is after you are using long balloon, that means protruding with both balloons in main vessel stand, uh, you should finish with pot in order to leave uh, good expansion or symmetrical expansion of the stent in main vessel. This is the yeah, main, yeah, yeah. main issue. That's a good point. That's a good point. If, you were, if you're doing it with your final kiss and there's long overlapping balloons in your proximal main branch, it makes the stent very oval. And so uh -huh. you can try and circular, circularize it. That's a great point. So, um, Arazi, I'm, sure, I'm sorry to show this slide and I'm not trying to compare cases, but uh, it was unplanned. I didn't know what case you were going to show. But this is kind of the standard crush, right? So now imagine for the fellows, this is what Dr. Arazi had to cross through one stent into this, okay? When you do a DK crush, this is what you cross. You have an open side branch already um, and it makes it much easier to cross. So this is kind of why I like the DK crush is just because, especially for the fellows, it will just make it a little bit easier in case you don't have Dr. Arazi or someone like me next to you to help you cross into the side branches. Gentlemen, we have two minutes left. Yeah, yeah I'm, on, I'm ending my case, don't you worry. I have dinner plans in, in two minutes too, so I, I'll get done. Um, so we then put a stent in the main branch, we did a pot, and then we did our final kiss, and here's the final result, uh, which looks really good in this bifurcation. Um, and you'll see the imaging here on the side as well. 
which I think looks great uh, for this bifurcation. Um, and then, you know, I always say it's not done until you make sure your access is okay. And that's when the case is really done. So um, we did our final angio from the left radial to make sure that the access was okay. And also it allows you to have a bailout balloon if you need. The one thing I will say is if you do the crush properly, okay, whether it's a standard crush or it's a DK crush, the result in the ostium can be very similar depending on how you do it. And I'm sure that the result with, that Dr. Razi did, you know, in her crush is very similar to the one I did. Maybe my procedure made it just a little bit easier to recross at the end. I'm going to stop there uh, and see if there are any last minute questions before we end. So and, it's very important to recognize that Azim and, and, and Antonio were probably proponents of the original crush and Azim published a lot of literature on the initial crush and the and the uh, drawbacks to that technique before DK crush came along. So thank you for your expertise, Azim. Uh, Imad or uh, Ross? Absolutely. Great case. I, I think this is a very good demonstration about uh, about essential thing in bifurcation. That means step by step, decide, plan your uh, procedure. Uh, from the beginning, that means you should know whether it is a two-stent uh, strategy should be, I mean, the default strategy in, the, in, the, in this patient or uh, provisional. So first of all, the first step should be planning the procedure, one or two stents. Then choose the more adequate uh, uh, te uh, technique for uh, double stenting. Uh, I think DK crush in this case was a very good uh, uh, choice because of uh, the angle between the uh, side branch and the main vessel was less than 70. And I think this, this is a good choice for, for crush. DK crush, I totally agree with uh, Latif that it, if you are doing a crush today, the default strategy is DK crush, not any other uh, crushing, crushing technique because as he showed, uh, it is, uh, there's a big difference. I mean, in, in final result, you do not have three large stents in front of the, of the, the uh, side branch. You will have uh, uh, just one layer and you can open it easily and uh, uh, not leaving any bulky uh, accumulation of metal on, on side branch as it could happen with the uh, conventional crush or mini crush sometime. Well, thank you everybody. We've come to 7 p.m. Thank you for excellent cases and walking through each of the step, a variety from three different approaches, but I hope our audience benefited from this. And thank you very much to our international visitors, Imad and Francisco, and thank you Azim and Rossi for great case presentations for the bifurcation hour. We'll continue this. Good night.